that spring of 1974, I had rented a boathouse in Seattle to use as an office, subletting the creaky little one-room structure that floated precariously on the logs in Lake Union, a mile south of the university district. I was fully aware now that two college girls were missing, that Kathy Devine had been murdered, and I was beginning to sense that police felt a pattern was emerging, but the public remained unaware. Seattle averages about 60 homicides a year. King County vacillates from two or three to a dozen annually, and Thurston County rarely exceeds three. Not a bad percentage for areas highly populated, and things appeared to be normal. Tragic, but normal. My ex-husband had suffered a sudden grand mal epileptic seizure. His cancer had metastasized to the brain. He underwent surgery and was hospitalized for several weeks. My youngest daughter, Leslie, then 16, took a bus to Seattle every day after school to take care for her father. She didn't think the nurses were attentive enough. I was worried. She was so lovey, looked so much like the girls who were disappearing, and I was frightened to have her walk even half a block alone in the city. She was insistent that it was something she had to do, and I held my breath each day until she was home safe. I was experiencing the kind of dread that soon every parent in the area would feel. As a crime writer, I had seen too much violence, too much tragedy, and I saw suspicious men everywhere I went. I have never been afraid for myself, but for my daughters? Oh yes, for my daughters. I warned them so much that they finally accused me of getting paranoid. I gave up the houseboat. I didn't want to be that far away from my children, not even during the daytime hours. On April 17th, it happened again. This time, the girl who vanished was 120 miles away from Seattle, far across the looming Cascade Mountains that separate the verdant coastland of Washington from the arid wheat fields of the eastern half of the state. Susan Elaine Rancourt was a freshman at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg. A rodeo town that has retained the flavor of the Old West. One of the six children in a close family, Susan had been a cheerleader and a homecoming queen in LaConnor Washington High School. She differed from the other missing girls in that she was a blonde, a blonde with long hair and blue eyes. She had the sort of stunning figure that most teenage girls pray for, not to mention teenage boys. Perhaps her early development had contributed to her shyness and eclipsed the fact that Susan had a superior, scientifically-oriented intelligence. When the rest of her family moved to Anchorage, Alaska, it took courage on Susan's part to stay behind to attend college in Ellensburg. She'd known she'd have to pay most of her own way. With five other siblings to raise, her family just didn't have the money to foot all her college bills. The summer before her freshman year, Susan worked two full-time jobs, seven days a week, to save money for her tuition. She'd always known that her career would be in the field of medicine, and her high school grades, straight A's, and her college aptitude scores verified that she was a natural. At Ellensburg, Susan Rancourt was majoring in biology, still getting a straight 4.0 grade point average, and working a full-time job in a nursery home. She was a young woman any family would be proud of. Where Linda Healy had been cautious and Donna Manson had been heedless of danger, Susan Rancourt was frankly afraid of the dark, of being out alone. She never went anywhere without her roommate after the sun had set. Never until the evening of April 17th. It had been a busy week for her, midterm finals were being held, but she learned of an opportunity open for a would-be dorm advisors. With that job, her expenses could be cut a great deal. Besides, it would give her a chance to meet more students, to break out of her self-imposed shell of shyness. So she took a chance. Susan was only five feet two and weighed 120 pounds, but she was strong. She jogged every morning and she'd gone to karate classes. Perhaps she had been foolish to think she couldn't protect herself on a crowded campus even if someone did approach her. At eight o'clock that evening, she took a load of laundry to a washroom in one of the campus's dorms and walked off to the advisor's meeting. The meeting was over at nine and she planned to meet a friend to see a German film and then returned to the laundromat to pick up her clothes in the dryer at 10 o'clock. But no one saw Susan after she left the meeting. Her friend waited and waited and then finally went into the film alone, looking back towards the entrance several times for a familiar sight of Susan's figure. 
Susan's clothes remained in the washer until another student who needed to use it impatiently removed them and set them on the table, where they were discovered a day later. Susan Rancourt's failure to return to her dorm was reported at once. Susan had a boyfriend, but he was far away at the University of Washington in Seattle, and she dated no one else. She just wasn't the type not to come home at night, and she surely wouldn't have missed a final exam. She'd never even skipped a class. Campus police officers noted down the outfit she'd worn when she had last been seen. Gray corduroy slacks, a short-sleeved yellow sweater, a yellow coat, and a brown hush puppy shoes. And then they attempted to retrace the route she would have taken from the advisors' meeting back to the dormitories a quarter mile away. The quickest and most common route led up to the mall, past a construction area, across a footbridge over a pond, and then under a railroad trestle near a student parking lot. If someone watched her, followed her, and meant to grab her, one officer commented, it would have been here, under the trestle, as stark as hell for about 20 feet. But there should have been something left of Susan there. For one thing, she had been carrying a folder full of loose papers that would have been scattered in every direction in the struggle. And as shy as she was, Susan Rancourt was a fighter, adept at karate. Her friends insisted that there was no way she would have given up quietly. Beyond that, the path back to Bartow Hall, where the film was being shown, was the route most students took. At nine at night, there would have been steady, light traffic. Someone should have seen something unusual, but no one had. Susan had one physical imperfection. She was very nearsighted. On the night of April 17th, she had worn neither her glasses nor her contact lenses. She could have seen well enough to make her way around the campus, but she would have had to walk up quite close to someone to recognize him. And she might well have missed a subtle movement in the shadows beneath the trestle. With the disappearance of Susan Rancourt, other co-eds came forward with the descriptions of incidents that had vaguely disturbed them. One girl said she had talked to a tall, handsome man in his 20s outside the campus library on April 12th, a man who had one arm in a sling and a metal brace on his finger. He had had trouble managing his armload of books and had dropped several. Finally, he asked me if I'd help him carry them to his car, she recalled. The car, a Volkswagen Bug, was parked about 300 yards from the railroad trestle. She'd carried his books to the car and then noticed the passenger seat was missing. Something, she couldn't even say what, had caused the hairs on the back of her neck to stand on end. Something about that missing seat. He seemed nice enough, and they talked about how he'd been injured skiing at Crystal Mountain, but suddenly she just wanted to be away from him. I put the books on the hood of his car, and I ran. A second girl told a story very like the first. She had met the man with an injured arm on the 17th, and had carried some packages wrapped in butcher paper to his car for him. Then he told me that he was having trouble getting it started, and asked me to get in and try the ignition while he did something under the hood. I didn't know him. I didn't want to get in his car, and I just made some excuse about being in a hurry, and I left. The son of an Oregon district attorney visiting on a campus remembered seeing a tall man with his arm in a sling standing in front of Bartow Hall around 8.30 on the evening of the 17th. The reports didn't seem all that ominous. Any time a crime or a disappearance occurs, ordinary incidents take on an importance for a witness who want to help. The statements were typed, bowed away, and the search for Susan Raincourt continued. In this case, as in many others, a minute detail would provide mute testimony to the fate of the missing girls. With Donna Manson, it had been her camera left behind. But Susan, it was her contact lenses. And her glasses. Glasses that she probably meant to carry with her to the movie on the night she vanished. And her dental floss. When her mother looked into her medicine cabinet and saw the dental floss, she felt her heart thud. She was such a creature of habit. She never went anywhere overnight without dental floss. Captain Herb Swingler, a massive bulldog of a cop, a veteran in homicide investigations, had taken over command of the Crimes Against Persons Unit of Seattle Police Department in the spring of 1974. I had known Herb for more than 15 years. 
In the late 50s, he was the patrol officer who had responded first to a complaint of an indecent liberties by the mother of a small girl in West Seattle, and I was the most rookie of all policemen who was called in to question the child. I had been 21 then, and admittedly somewhat embarrassed at the questions I had to ask the little girl about the nice old man who boarded with the family. I remember how Herb teased me because I had blushed, the standard razzing the new policewoman received. But he had been gentle with the child, and with her mother. He was a good cop, and a thorough investigator, and he'd moved up rapidly through the ranks. Now the buck stopped in Herb's office. Most of the missing girls' cases had seemingly originated in Seattle, and he was wrestling day and night with the mysteries that seemed to have no clues. No answers. It was as if the man responsible was taunting the police, laughing at the ease with which he abducted the women, leaving no trace of himself. Swindler is a talkative man, and he needed a sounding board. I filled that need. He knew I wouldn't talk to anyone outside the department, knew I'd follow the cases as meticulously as any detective. Certainly, I was a writer looking for the big story, but I was also the mother of two teenage daughters. And the horror of it all, the agony of the parents, kept me awake at night. He was confident I wouldn't publish a word until the time was right, if ever. During those months in 1974, I talked to Swindler almost every day. Listening, trying to find some common denominator, my territory took me up and down the coast, and I often knew of cases in other cities, cases 200 miles away in Oregon. I had reported any disappearance that might tie into the Seattle cases. The next girl to walk away forever lived in Oregon. Nineteen days after Susan Rancourt vanished, on May 6th, Roberta Kathleen Kathy Parks had spent an unhappy and guilt-ridden day in her room in Sackett Hall on the Oregon State University campus in Corvallis, 250 miles south of Seattle. I knew Sackett Hall. I'd lived there myself when I attended one term of OSU back in the 1950s. It was a huge, modern dormitory complex on a campus that was then considered a cow college. Even then, when the world didn't seem to be so fraught with danger, none of us would ever go to the snack machines in the cavernous basement corridors alone at night. Kathy Parks wasn't very happy at Oregon State. She was homesick for Lafayette, California, and she'd broken up with her boyfriend, who'd left for Louisiana. On May 4th, Kathy had argued on a phone call with her father, and on May 6th, she had learned that he had suffered a massive heart attack. Her sister had called her from Spokane, Washington, with the news of their father's coronary, and then called back some hours later to say that it looked as though he would survive. Kathy, whose major was world religions, felt a little better after the second call, and she agreed to join some of the other residents of Sackett Hall in an exercise session in the dorm lounge. Shortly before 11, the tall, slender girl with long, ash-blonde hair left Sackett Hall to meet some of her friends for coffee in the student union building. She promised her roommate she would be back within the hour, wearing blue slacks, a navy blue top, a light green jacket, and platform sandals. She left Sackett for the last time. Kathy never made the student union building. Like the others, all of her possessions were left behind, her bike, clothing, cosmetics. This time, no one had seen anyone suspicious. No man with his arm in a sling. No Volkswagen bugs. Kathy had never talked of being afraid or of receiving obscene phone calls. She had been a girl so subject to wide mood swings that the question of suicide arose. Had she felt so guilty about fighting with her father? Perhaps believing that she had caused his heart attack? Guilty enough to take her own life? The Williamette River, which winds its way near Corvallis, was dragged, and nothing was found. Had she chosen another means of self-destruction, her body would surely be located soon. But it was not. Lieutenant Bill Harris of the Oregon State Police Criminal Investigation Unit was stationed on the OSU campus, and he headed the probe in Oregon. He had had a tragic homicide in Sackett Hall a few years before where a co-ed was found stabbed to death in her room, but his successful investigation had resulted in the arrest of a male student who lived on the upper floor. That youth was still in the Oregon State Penitentiary. 
After a week-long search, Harris was convinced that Kathy Parks had been abducted, probably seized as she walked between the great masses of lilac bushes blooming along the pathway between Sackett Hall and the Student Union Building. Gone, like all the others, without a single cry for help. Police bulletins with pictures of the four missing girls were tacked up side by side on the office walls of every law enforcement agency in the Northwest, smiling faces that looked enough alike to be sisters. Yet only Herb Swindler was absolutely convinced that Kathy Parks was part of the pattern. Other detectives felt Corvallis was too far away for her to be a victim of the same man who prowled Washington campuses. There was to be only a short respite. Twenty-six days later, a casual acquaintance of my elder daughter, Brenda Carroll Ball, 22, who lived with two roommates in the South King County suburb of Buren, disappeared. Brenda had been a high-line community college student only two weeks before. She was five foot three, 112 pounds, and her brown eyes sparkled with zest for life. On the night of May 31st, June 1st, Brenda went alone to the Flame Tavern at 128th South and Abum Road South. Her roommates had seen her last at 2 p.m. that Friday afternoon when she told them that she had planned to go to the tavern and mentioned that she might catch a ride afterward to Sun Lake State Park in eastern Washington and meet them there. She did go to the flame and was seen there by several people who knew her. No one remembers exactly what she was wearing, but her usual garb was faded blue jeans and a long-sleeved turtleneck tops. She seemed to be having a good time, and stayed until closing at 2 a.m. Brenda asked one of the musicians in the band for a ride home, but he explained he was heading in another direction. The last time anyone remembers seeing Brenda Ball, she was talking in the parking lot with a handsome, brown-haired man who had one arm in a sling. Because Brenda, like Donna Manson, was a free spirit, given to impulsive trips, there was a long delay before she was officially reported missing. Nineteen days passed before her roommates became convinced that something had happened to her. They checked with her bank and were alarmed when they learned that her savings account hadn't been touched. All of her clothing was still in their apartment. Her parents, who lived nearby, hadn't heard from her either. At 22, Brenda was the oldest of all the missing women, an adult who had proved herself capable and cautious in the past. But not now. It seemed that Brenda, too, had met someone she could not have trusted. Brenda was gone. But the stalking was far from over. Even before Brenda Ball was reported as a missing person to King County Police, the man law enforcement officers sought was on the prowl again, about to strike audaciously, virtually in full view of dozens of witnesses, and still remain only a phantom figure. He would thumb his nose at police, leaving them as frustrated as as they had ever been in the series of crimes that had already both galled and horrified them. Many of the detectives searching for the missing girls had daughters of their own. It was as if it were some kind of perverse game of challenge on the part of the abductor, as if each time he would come a little further out of the shadows, take more chances to prove that he could do what he wanted and still not be caught or even seen. Georgianne Hawkins, at 18, was one of those golden girls for whom luck or fate had dealt a perfect hand until an inexplicable night of June 10th. Raised in Tacoma, suburb of summer, she had been a daffodil princess, and like Susan Rancourt, a cheerleader and an honor student at Lakes High School. She had a vivacious, pixie-like quality to her loveliness, glossy long brown hair, and a lively brown eyes. She was tiny, five feet two inches tall, 115 pounds, healthy in a glowing way, the youngest of two daughters of the Warren B. Hawkins family. While many good students tend to find the University of Washington's curriculum much more difficult than that of a high school and drop to a comfortable C average, Georgianne had continued to maintain a straight A record. Her biggest worry during that finals week of June 1974 was that she was having a difficult time with Spanish. She considered dropping the course, but on the morning of June 10th, she had phoned her mother and said she was going to cram for the next day's final as hard as she could, and she thought she could handle it. She already had a summer job lined up, 
with Pierce County and Tacoma, and she discussed it by phone with her parents at least once a week. During rush week in September of 1973, Georgianne had been tapped by one of the top sororities in campus, Kappa Alpha Theta, and lived in the big house amongst several other Greek houses along 7th Avenue and E. Residents of the sororities and fraternities along Greek Row visit back and forth much more freely than they did back in the 50s when it was strictly forbidden for members of the opposite sex to venture above the formal living rooms on the first floor. Georgianne frequently dropped in to see her boyfriend, who lived in the Beta Theta Pi house, six houses down from the Theta house. During the early evening hours of Monday, June 10th, Georgianne and a sorority sister had gone to a party where they had one or two mixed drinks. Georgianne explained that she had to get back to study for her Spanish exam, but first she was going to stop by the Beta house and say goodnight to her boyfriend. Georgianne was cautious. She rarely went anywhere on campus alone at night, but the area along 17th Avenue and E was so familiar, so well lighted, and there was always someone around she knew. The fraternal organizations front the street on each side, with a grassy island running down the middle. Trees, in full leaf in June, do block out some of the street lights. They've grown so tall since they were planted back in the 20s. The alley that runs in back of the Greek houses from 45th NE to 47th NE is as bright as day, lit by street lights every 10 feet or so. June 10th was a warm night, and every window opening onto the alley was open. It is doubtful that any of the student residents were asleep. Even at midnight, most of them were cramming for finals with the aid of black coffee and no-dos. Georgianne did go to the Beta House a little before 12.30 a.m. on June 11th. She visited with her steady boyfriend for a half hour or so, borrowed some Spanish notes, and then said goodnight and left by the back door to walk the 90 feet down to the back door of the Theta house. One of the other betas heard the door slam and stuck his head out the window, recognizing George Ann. Hey, George, he called loudly. What's happening? The pretty, deeply tanned girl wearing blue slacks, a white backless t-shirt, and a sheer red, white, and blue top craned her neck and looked back. She smiled and waved, talked for a moment or two about the Spanish exam, and then laughing said, Adios. She turned and headed south towards her residence. He watched her for about 30 feet. Two other male students who knew her recalled that they saw her traverse the next 20 feet. She had 40 feet to go, 40 feet in the alley brightly lit. Certainly, there were some murky areas between the big houses, filled with laurel hedges, blooming rhododendrons, but Georgianne would have stayed in the middle of the alley. Her roommate, Dean Nichols, waited for the familiar sound of pebbles hitting their window. Georgianne had lost her key to the back door, and the sorority sister would have to run down the stairs to let her in. There was no rattling of pebbles. There was no sound. No outcry. Nothing. An hour passed. Two hours. Worried, Dee called the Beta House and learned Georgianne had left for home a little after 1 a.m. She awoke the house mother and said softly, Georgianne's gone. She didn't come home. They waited through the night, trying to find some reasonable explanation for why Georgianne might be gone, not wanting to alarm her parents at 3 a.m. In the morning, they called the Seattle police. Detective Bud Gelberg of the Missing Persons Unit took the report and rechecked with the fraternity house where she had last been seen, then called her parents. Usually, any police department will wait 24 hours before beginning a search for a missing adult, but in view of the events of the first half of 1974, the disappearance of George N. Hawkins was treated very, very seriously immediately. At 8.45 a.m., Detective Sergeant Ivan Beeson and Detectives Ted Faunus and George Cuthill of the Homicide Unit arrived at the Theater House, 4521 17th NE. They were accompanied by George Ishii, one of the most renowned criminalists in the Northwest. Ishii, who heads the Western Washington State Crime Lab, is a brilliant man. A man who probably knows more about the detection, preservation, and testing of physical evidence than any other criminalist in the western half of the United States. He was my first teacher of crime scene investigation. 
In two quarters, I learned more about physical evidence than I ever had before. Ishii believes implicitly in the theories of Dr. E. Lacard, a pioneer French criminalist who states, Every criminal leaves something of himself at the scene. Something, no matter how minute, and always takes something of the scene away with him. Every good detective knows this. This is why they search so intensely at a crime scene for that small part of the perpetrator that he has left behind. A hair, a drop of blood, a thread, a button, a finger or palm print, a footprint, traces of semen, tool marks, shell casings, and in most instances, they find it. The criminalist and the three homicide detectives covered that alleyway behind 45th and 47th NE, that 90 feet on their hands and knees, and found nothing at all. Leaving that alley cordoned off and guarded by patrolmen, they went into the theater house to talk with George Ann's sorority sisters and her house mother. George Ann lived in number eight in the house, a room she shared with Dee Nichols. All of her possessions were there, everything but the clothes she had been wearing and her leather purse, a tan sack bag with reddish stains on it. In that purse, she had carried her ID, a few dollars, a bottle of heaven-scent perfume with angels on the label, and a small hairbrush. Georgianne never went any place without leaving me the phone number where she'd be, Dee said. I know she intended to come back here last night. She had one more exam and then she was going home for the summer on the 13th. The blue slacks, the one she was wearing, were missing three buttons. There was only one left. I can give you one of the buttons like it from our room. Like Susan Rancourt, Georgianne was very myopic. She wasn't wearing her glasses or her contacts last night, her roommate recalled. She'd worn her contacts all day to study, and after you've worn contact lenses for a long time, things look blurry when you put glasses on so she wasn't wearing them either. The missing girl could have seen well enough to navigate the familiar alley, but she would have seen nothing more than a vague outline of a figure more than 10 feet away. If someone had been lurking in the alley, someone who had learned Georgian's name after hearing the youth call to her from the beta house window, he could easily have used a soft George to call her close to him, and she would have had to walk very close indeed in order to recognize the man who beckoned to her. Perhaps so close that she could have been seized, gagged, carried off before she had a chance to cry out? Surely, anyone looking down the alley would have been alerted at the sight of a man carrying her away. Or would they? There were always high jinks during finals week, anything to break the tension. And a strong young men frequently picked up giggling, squealing girls playing caveman. But no one had seen even that. George Ann Hawkins may have been knocked out with one blow, chloroformed, injected with a swift-acting nervous system depressant, or just pinioned in powerful arms, a hand held tightly over her mouth so that she couldn't even scream. She was afraid of the dark, Dee said quietly. Sometimes we would walk all the way around a block just to avoid a dark spot along the sidewalk. When he got her... I know that she was hurrying back here. I don't think she had a chance. The sorority sister who had attended the party earlier in the evening with George Ann remembered that they'd parted on the corner of 47th NE and 17th NE. She stood and waited while I walked to our house, and I yelled to her that I was okay, and she yelled back that she was okay. All of us kind of checked on each other like that. She went into the beta house, and that, that's the last time I ever saw her. It was incomprehensible then, and it's still incomprehensible to Seattle homicide detectives, that George Ann Hawkins could vanish so completely within a space of 40 feet. Of all the cases of missing girls, it is the Hawkins case that baffles them the most. It was something that couldn't have happened, and yet it did. When the news of George Ann's disappearance hit the media, two witnesses came forward with stories of incidents on June 11th that were amazingly similar. An attractive sorority girl said that she had been walking in front of the Greek houses on 17th NE at about 12.30 a.m. 
when she'd seen a young man on crutches just ahead of her. One leg of his jeans had been cut up the side and he appeared to have a full cast on his leg. He was carrying a briefcase with a handle and he kept dropping it. I offered to help him, but I told him I had to go into one of the houses for a few minutes and if he didn't mind waiting, I'd come out and help him get his stuff at home. And did you? No. I was inside longer than I thought and he was gone when I came out. A male college student also had seen the tall, good-looking man with the briefcase and crutches. A girl was carrying his case for him. Then later on, after I'd taken my girl home, I saw the girl again, walking alone. He looked at a picture of George Ann Hawkins, but said he was positive she wasn't the girl he'd seen. At this time, the notation in the Susan Rancourt file in Ellensburg about the man with his arm in a sling was not generally known. Only after publicity about the man with his leg in the cast was disseminated would the two incidents so far apart be coordinated. Coincidence or part of a sly plan to throw young women off guard? Detectives canvassed every house on each side of the 17th NE at the Phi Sigma Sigma fraternity at 4520, just across from the theater house. They found that the house mother recalled being awakened from a sound sleep between 1 and 2 in the morning of June 11th. It was a scream that awakened me. It was a high-pitched scream. A terrified scream. And then it just stopped, and everything was quiet. I figured it was just kids horsing around, but now I... I wish... I, I wish I'd... No one else heard it. Linda. Donna. Susan. Kathy. Brenda. Georgianne. All gone, as completely as if a seam in the backdrop of life itself had opened, drawn them in, and closed without leaving so much as a mended tear in the tapestry. George Ann Hawkins' father, his voice breaking, summed up the feelings of all the desperately worried parents who waited for some word. Every day. I'm a little bit lower. You'd like to hope. But I'm too realistic. She was a very friendly very involved youngster. I keep saying was. I shouldn't say that. It's a job raising kids. You steer them along and we'd figured we'd had both our kids over the hump. Any homicide detective who has ever tried to cope with the anguish of parents who realize intuitively that their children are dead but have not even the faint comfort of knowing where their bodies are can attest to the fact that this is the worst. One weary investigator commented to me, it's rough. <laughs> it's damn rough. When you have to tell them that you found a body and it's their kid, but it's never over for the parents who just don't know. They can't really have a funeral they can't know that their children aren't being held and tortured someplace. They can't face their grief and get over it. <laughs> Hell, you never get over it, but if you know, you can pick up your life again, somehow. The girls were gone, and each set of parents tried to deal with it, brought in the records that would mean the identification one day, perhaps of a decomposed body. Dental records, all the years of paying for fillings and orthodontics so that their daughters would have good teeth to last a lifetime. The x-rays from Donna Manson's broken bones, set clean and strong again. And for Georgianne, x-rays taken when she suffered from Osgood Schlatter's disease as a teenager and inflammation of the tibia near the knee. After months of concern, her legs had grown long and shapely, marked only by slight bumps just below the knee. Any of us who have raised children know, as John F. Kennedy once said, that to have children is to give hostages to fate. To lose a child to an illness, or even an accident, can be dealt with during the passage of time. 
To lose a child to a predator, an insanely brilliant killer, is almost more than any human should have to bear. When I began writing fact detective stories, I promised myself that I would always remember I was writing about the loss of human beings, that I was never to forget that. I hoped that the work I did might somehow save other victims, might warn them of the danger. I never wanted to become tough, to seek out the sensational and the gory, and I never have. I have joined the Committee of Friends and Families of Missing Persons and the Victims of Violent Crimes at the invitation of the group. I have met many parents of victims, cried with them, and yet I have somehow felt guilty because I make a living from other people's tragedies. When I told the committee how I felt, they put their arms around me and said, No, keep on writing. Let the public know how it is for us. Let them know how we hurt and how we try to save other parents' children by working for new legislation that requires mandatory sentencing and the death penalty for killers. They are far stronger than I could ever be. And so I kept on, trying to find the answer to the awful puzzle, believing that the killer, when he was found, would prove to be a man with a record of violence. A man who should never have been allowed to walk the streets. Someone who must surely have shown signs of a deranged mind in the past. Someone who had been let out of prison too soon. 